My name is Jennifer Colson. I am the president of the Orleans Audubon Society, and I have been on the board for a couple of decades and a little bit more. And I am um, a raptor researcher. I got uh, my uh, bachelor's degree and master's degree in biology from UNO. Uh, Dr. Lita Pinter was my major professor at UNO. And then I worked at the Audubon Zoo and uh, taught at Nunes Community College and then went to Tulane University at the same time that Donata Henry was. We both studied ecology and evolutionary biology with uh, Tom Sherry is our, directing our dissertation research. And my subject, of course, for my study was the population ecology of the swallowtail kite. And uh, so a lot of this comes from that, this talk. I'm also a falconer and uh, Tom and I, my husband Tom and I, uh, hunt with a group of Harris hawks and we also breed Harris hawks in captivity. And we wrote a big falconry book on the Harris Hawk and its use in, in the sport. And I guess the only other thing that would be something to tell everybody, if you don't know me, um, I really, really love swallowtail kites and uh, am going to tell you why I think they're such an amazing species and summarize re my research to date. So I would like to tell you how fantastic and amazing the swallowtail kite is. I am always thrilled when I have people calling me who have seen a swallowtail kite for the first time. I've never seen anything like it. It's the most amazing thing. You know, people really get worked up about them. It, it is, uh, we might call it a gateway bird because it's able to, um, it's easily identifiable and it's got such a dramatic silhouette that it really gets people excited right off the bat. So somebody who, you know, enjoys being outdoors and, and likes animals, but isn't really particularly into birds is often really captivated by the swallowtail kite. So it's, uh, it's good for birds and birding and it's good for conservation because of its charismatic universal appeal. It makes it a good conservation biology species. It's got a wide range. So if you protect swallowtail kite habitat, chances are you're protecting a whole suite of birds and animals and plants that depend on uh, you know, forested wetlands where we find swallowtail kites. So I wanna start off with just a basic, like what is a kite? Because a kite is a construct, it's not a taxonomic group. So what we call kites are, some of them are related and some of them are only distantly related. They're all in the hawk and uh, you know, the, the, the hawks and eagles and, and uh, hawk eagles and harriers and such family, the Occipitridae and the order Occipitriformes. Um, then the elanid kites are the white-tailed kite, for example, would be the one people are familiar with that we have in southwest Louisiana. And then the swallowtail kites are in this group of that it's close, some of its closest relatives are bozzes and honey buzzards. Um, so it's a, it's a really different, even though it has a lot of similarities to, to white-tail kites, it's not that closely related. And then we can come down to here where we find things like the, uh, the double-tooth kite is in the um, Harpageus kites. And then we have the Milvian kites, which include the Mississippi kite. And then notice down here, we have the Buteos. So that would be like the red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawk, et cetera, broad-winged hawk. So they are all these hawk type birds that are weakly predatory. So they are somewhat examples of convergent evolution because you know, they aren't as similar. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a few little comparisons between swallowtail and Mississippi kite because those are birds we see close together. We see them feeding together. And it's easy to think, oh, well, you know, they're both kites, they must be closely related, and they're actually not. They're more examples of, as I said, convergent evolution. And down here's a double tooth kite. I hope I said that before. Anyway. So here are the close relatives of the swallowtail kite in the subfamily 
Piranay, all right? So on, we have honey buzzards, and these guys are crazy. Like a lot of times you just see them covered with bees or stinging insects, and they love combs. They are really something of a wasp specialist, and some of the bazas are too. So these are birds that lack a brow and generally have a fairly weakly hooked beak. And I think the swallowtail kite is something of a wasp specialist, and I'm not the first one to say this, but let me go ahead and get this, let me try to get this video playing here. All right, this is a swallowtail kite that was undergoing rehabilitation, and I gave it a um, ribbon snake that we found that had just been hit by a car. And it, I want you to just notice how it has a heck of a time with, uh, oops, I didn't mean to stop that, with tearing up the snake. So they have an elongated weak bill compared to other raptors and they lack a brow. And that is, it's actually a little bony extension off the brow that, that many birds of prey have, but the, um, the kites and the Pyrenees don't have that. Uh, they also have densely feathered lores. The lores is the face, it's the region between the eyes and the bill, and that may be to help protect from stinging uh, prey. And they also have a, a thick spongy lining to the stomach, which might protect them from stinging, like if they eat a stinging wasp and don't take the stinger out. So here you can see this is a juvenile swallows okay that was undergoing rehabilitation. You can see the densely feathered lures here and the bill is really elongated and it's pretty thin and weak. So it takes it a while to tear up even an animal lizard. And we could compare this to a Mississippi kite that's again not closely related. It has this fierce brow and it has a shorter uh, sharply hooked, much stronger beak. Like if you had to pick, do you want to be bitten by a swallowtail kite or Mississippi kite? You now know swallowtail kite, <laughs> if you had to pick. Okay, so here's, a, this is a nest that was at the Abita Flatwoods Preserve this year. And what I have circled here, which is kind of hard to tell, but th those are wasp combs on either side of the nest. And under this nest, Donata helped me with checking this nest, Towards the end of the season, there was just a carpet of empty wasp nests. So paper wasps build these umbrella type nests and, you know, the kites are grabbing them on the fly and flying off with them and they are uh, picking the larvae out and then they just discard the wasp nest afterward. Oh, and here's a picture by Clay Coleman of a swallowtail kite in the Atchafalaya Basin that's carrying a wasp nest. So other specializations of the swallowtail kite um, include its flight style. Uh, they are experts they, at going very slowly. In fact, they may be the best slow flying raptors uh, on the planet. They're able to go extremely slowly without stalling out. So one of the things that helps them to do this is they have a very light wing loading. The wing loading is the surface area of the wing to, versus the weight of the bird. So while the swallowtail kite has this four foot wide wingspan and this really long forked tail, it's actually pretty light. So it only weighs about um, you know, 450 to 500 grams. And so that's a lot of, um, it, it's a little bit of weight to be going uh, across wings that wide. So it has a light wing loading that allows it to glide and float very easily. And uh, as my pilot says, these birds really love to fly. So you can see down at the um, bottom there, I've got a swallowtail kite that's inverted. I see that all the time from the airplane. I'll watch them. They're just going after a bug. And, you know, it's just a little bug in the air. It doesn't have to invert, but it just goes like, shoomp, like that and flips itself over. Why? Because it can, you know, <laughs> I think um, maybe there are times when inversion really is a hunting strategy, but. And then they also have a very high lift to drag ratio. And this has to do with that forked tail. Now this is a swallowtail kite that's um, flying away, flying in this direction, and its tail is closed tightly and it's hanging its tail down. 
And that is because it has caught a green snake and the green snake doesn't want to give up the ghost. And it's wrapped around the snake's tail. And I, I see this, you know, several times a year at least because green snakes are one of their favorite prey items. Tom and I saw this kite dip down below a house and catch this uh, snake in a field. And then when it came back up, it was having a heck of a time flying. It was really having to flap a lot because swallowtail kites don't flap much usually because of their light wing loading. And it was flapping because it couldn't use its tail to help with the lift to drag ratio. And, and uh, it was trying to lean down and kill the snake and not fall to the ground. I've really seen them when they catch a snake, like from when I want to follow them in the air, fall out of the air for a little ways and then catch themselves and then like flap, 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 trying to get up and trying to kill the snake. And anyway, you know, maybe they just need a little bit of a bigger beak, but <laughs> hint, hint, kites. But, but yeah, they're really amazing uh, flyers and they, they hardly ever have to flap their wings. Now this is showing the tail spread. The tail, when, when the kite goes to land it's or alight on something, it really has to spread its uh, tail and it's got its wings spread there to, it's bringing food into the nest. And here's another adult and there's a nestling in the middle there. Usually the male will hand over food to the, not hand over, but pass over food beak to beak to the female to feed the young. So this, the, the longer the tail that accentuates the lift to, gra to drag ratio and allows the bird to stay aloft without stalling out. Now we can compare this to a Mississippi kite. A Mississippi kite um, is a much like, it's a faster flyer when it's flying straight out and, and having to flap, flapping flight. Uh, and it has a, a rectangular tail. I have seen these guys, uh, do some spiraling diagonal stoops out of the sky that are incredible where they just keep spiraling down out of the sky. So they are really amazing flyers, but their flight style is really different. The swallowtail kite strategy, when it's trying to go so slowly is it's gonna circle a tree, circle a tree, circle a tree, and it's looking for like a gray tree frog um, that's up against the bark of the tree that's really well camouflaged, for example, or a tree roost in bat that's hiding under some leaves. So the, the Mississippi kite does hunt some of the same prey, but it's not able to go quite as slowly as the swallowtail. Let's look at some of the prey items then of the swallowtail kite. It likes a lot of green things. <laughs> It's not easy being green, a green tree frog. <laughs> you might get eaten by a swallowtail kite. I found luna moth wings under their nest. Um, they eat a lot of animals. They use a lot of these animals as display items, especially in the spring when the male has caught a green snake or an animal lizard or a green tree frog. It, he'll circle over a territory with that in his talons and just circle forever and ever and ever showing the female what a provider he is katydids and all kinds of insects. Um, some of their other prey include bats. This is an evening bat that was brought to a fledgling in Lacombe recently. Uh, and I had mentioned wasp nest. One of the fun things about wasp nest too is oftentimes the kite is snapping the branch off that the or the twig that the nest is supported on. So we can figure out what kind of trees the, the nests are coming out of. A lot of pine trees. Of course, that may be partly because they, the, their branches snap off easier too. And you might think this is a kite carrying nest material, which, you know, originally that's what we thought. Then we got binoculars on it and looked at it more closely. And I said, oh, it's leaning down and eating something in that moss. It ended up being a northern parallel nest. So it had snatched that out of a tree, which they hide their nest really well. They hide it in pendulous moss usually. So how this kite, maybe the kite saw the parent going in and out and then went in and got the nestlings or what, you know, I'm speculating there, but, but they fly so slowly and keep circling a tree till they figure out what's going on there. And it did eventually drop the moss, the mossy nest afterward. And you could see the, the you know, you can see the nest cup right there, but you could really see it as it was falling. And in, C Central and South America, especially South America, they sometimes eat fruit too. 
berries off of various palms and such, which is pretty weird. But uh, insects are probably the main prey, and then they're hunting some vertebrates during the nesting season when they're raising young. So some of the things that swallowtail kites do for us, uh, these are called ecosystem services. Uh, they are natural insect pest control. And you might say, well, come on, you know, what can a kite really, how can it really make a difference when you see a field that's just loaded down with grasshoppers? But I'm gonna tell you what, <coughs> excuse me, when you see a flock of 60 kites, 65 swallowtail kites, maybe there are 30 swallowtail, uh, Mississippi kites that have joined in, they can murder some bugs, y'all. They can do some damage. <laughs> and here, so one of the kites that we had tagged uh, died in Brazil, in Mato Grosso do Sul. And where it, we had a colleague in Brazil who was checking out the places that the kite visited, and he interviewed the landowners right around there. And we were trying to determine, like, was the kite shot? What might have happened to it? And he decided that it didn't seem very likely that the kite was shot because the people there were mostly farming cassava, you know, the tubers. And they really liked swallowtail kites because they knew that they came in big groups, you know, like 40 or more to feed on caterpillars and the cassava. And they thought that most of them were probably the cassava hornworm, although they couldn't confirm that for sure. Another way that kites will gather in big flock feeding flocks is uh, that they are attracted by fire. And so here is the Nature Conservancy burn crew, and they're about to do a controlled burn in St. Tammany Parish. And they invited me to join them. This was near uh, Money Hill, outside of Money Hill. Um, this is Bill Rivers and Tom Lydon, who are uh, the, the fire masters <laughs> for the Nature Conservancy. And here Tom is uh, pouring out some flames. <laughs> And this isn't a very hot burn or anything, but uh, it helps to clear some of the brush and maintain savanna. And these are Mississippi and swallowtail kites that are gathering around. Bill claims that in some of these areas where they do frequent burning, the kites show up when they see their equipment. I did see a kite pass by, a swallowtail kite pass by when they were assembling. And, and it could be true because, you know, they're smart, they associate when food arrives. And what, so what happens is the fire will singe the wings on insects and insects will fly out of the way. It makes them easier to catch. They rise up in the air column. And so they're looking for an easy meal here. So here we have um, a couple of swallowtail kites and some Mississippi kites. Uh, and this is well above where you can see visible smoke, but it's putting insects up into the air column. Now this is Chris LaRouge with Southeast Louisiana Refuges, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He was, I was working with him. He was letting me know where there were control burns in kite areas. And he would let me know as soon as swallowtail kites turned up. We had a male tagged, the Lacombe male, um, and he was tagged in Lacombe and, and often nested there. And so he was nesting about a mile away, maybe a little bit farther. And we were, you know, these are some of the locations that we had from his transmitter, and I actually saw him there once too, um, where he was feeding in a controlled burn area um, over several days, and other kites too that we had tagged fed in the same bur burn area. So they were some of them were traveling 10 miles to come to this area to get bugs. So it's kind of cool to see how that can be um, a food supply for them that they're using. So while they were doing this burn, mostly for red cockaded woodpeckers. They were also helping swallowtail kites. They might not have been helping Katie did so much though. <laughs> okay, so another ecosystem role of swallowtail kites uh, is that they are dispersers of Spanish moss and fruticose lichens. And this is a study that I've just started in the past few years. Uh, Swallowtail kites build this nest that's got, like this is a fruticose lichen hanging down here, this light green. Yeah, they, they have a, they make a basket of sticks. A lot of the sticks are lichen covered and it could have some pine straw in it too. Sometimes it has wasp nests in it. If they've been eating a wasp nest, they'll tamp that down in there. And then they festoon it with curtains of Spanish moss. 
the whole cup, the whole top of it is covered with Spanish moss and often fruticose lichens as well. Having the Spanish moss and the fruticose lichens, the, the moss they use it to tie the sticks in, to anchor the nest sometimes, but it's also helping to keep down bacteria because swallowtail well, kite babies, when they're in the nest, they don't do a good job of pooping over the side of the nest until they're bigger. And a lot of the, when they're younger, they're pooping straight into the nest. And so they keep bringing more moss in and more lichens to freshen up the nest, shall we say. Now, this is the East Pearl River. And this is, uh, the, we, the babies were being lowered down for me to tag them. But here you can see um, that, uh, so this is a nest that's well-worn, but it's got some fruticose lichens here and here and here and here. It's got some lichen covered stick twigs and then the moss hanging down. So just a little word about these nest material inclusions. Spanish moss, remember it's not really a moss. It's uh, a bromeliad, it's in the bromeliad pineapple family. It's an epiphyte, so it's pretty much living off of the air. It is not a parasite of the tree. And it's, it tends to be found in cypress and oaks that leach minerals uh, from their leaves like calcium, magnesium, uh, and phosphorus, and I forgot to say potassium. Anyway, uh, so they tend to, uh, cypress and oaks tend to leach more of these minerals then do some other trees. And, and the cypress tend to live in moister environments that they like. But anyway, this is a flower from Spanish moss. They can propagate through seeds and also through vegetative propagation, you know, a piece of moss breaking off and going through the wind. But they could also be carried by swallowtail kite. And then fruticose lichens are the lichens that, um, they're bunch lichens or um, old man's beard is one type that they use a lot. And these are, these are two from swallowtail kite nests. So a, a lichen, remember, is a fungus and an algae living in a symbiotic relationship. Some of them are cyanobacteria, but in this case, it's um, a fungus and an algal relationship. And the eucinia ones have eucinic acid, so it has some medicinal uses. And um, in fact, uh, Hippocrates even used uh, um, eucinia or fruticose lichens for urinary tract infections. They're still used in some medical uses. There are still some medical uses today. Anyway, uh, depending on the type of fruticose lichen, they can propagate vegetatively, um, just spreading or having pieces break off. And some of them form spores. But some of the rare ones, like the old man's beard, don't form spores. And so swallowtail kites could be really important dispersers for them. So Tom and I would see these trees where you're like, oh gosh, it's in a kite territory and um, there isn't any other moss around. And there's like this, it's, the moss starts right where we think a swallowtail kite nest would be. So we started paying attention to that. And, you know, th this is a, this was a nest tree like say seven years ago. And this one was one six years ago. And this is in the Honey Island Swamp of, off of Old Highway 11. So uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big disperser there. So some of the things we're looking at is, you know, returning to the nest tree years later. Is there any moss? If there is, what's the extent of the moss? Are there any lichens? Uh, and was it a nest that failed? Because when a nest has failed, the kite's not continually refurbishing it. So it might be less likely for moss to persist. So this was a nest um, in Talashik where the nest had failed. And this is the following year, the whole nest is gone. And, but there is some moss here that's taken hold. So we'll see. And then uh, this is uh, a nest that was successfully fledged young the year before. And there's some moss and some fruticose lichens that are there. Okay, so more about the, the life of a swallowtail kite. They're very social for birds of prey. Uh, they nest in groups, small groups. Uh, they roost communally. They hunt together and they mob predators together and they even sometimes bathe together. 
together. So here's a nesting neighborhood. This is at Walkeye Bluff on the East Pearl River. And so this is showing one, two, three, four, five, six nests that are in close proximity. We call these neighborhoods um, because they're, it's not really enough nest to call it a colony. Uh, I mean, I call it a colony sometimes, but you know, technically people say it's not like a heronry where you've got so many birds nesting together. But they really do spend a lot of time together. So birds that are all in using these nests would uh, okay, here's some birds displaying. Oops, wait, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong. There's a nest in one of these trees here, and these birds are returning to their nesting neighborhood and displaying. Shoot, I hit the wrong thing again, sorry. <laughs> okay, third time's the charm. So these are all adults, and they're going to go into a swoop chase dive. So they just cut across the sky like that, diving. So they do group displays over their neighborhood. Uh, they roost communally. This is a picture of a roost that took on Sherburn. Um, this was taken from Whiskey Bay Road. And actually, the roost was a lot bigger than this, but it's a sample of the roost. And in Florida, especially this time of year, and uh, late July, swallowtail kites gather into some really large roosts because peninsular Florida is one of the main places birds are going through. And Florida is really the hotbed of the swallowtail kites northern breathing range. So you could have anywhere from some of the roosts have 300 to 600 birds and sometimes over a thousand, sometimes 3000 or more. So let's see, uh, this is from a roost in Brazil that I happen to have video of, but just to give you an idea of how gregarious they really can be. And towards the end of this video, you just see that it's really, this was a roost of a thousand or more kites, just going on and on. <laughs> and by the way, those are sites that really need protection, those larger roosts that are pre-migration staging areas, they're important uh, information centers for kites. Okay, so group mobbing events. Uh, they involve most or all of the adults in the neighborhood and any visiting kites. Kites tend to, if they're not breeding yet, they tend to visit different air, nesting neighborhoods in roost areas. Uh, when there's been a, a dangerous predator, like a, a great horned owl has been detected or an eagle, um, the birds will mob for several days, and if a nest was raided by a predator, the, the whole colony will alarm call for days on end, circling um, the, if it was uh, babies that were killed at a nest or a mate, sometimes you'll see the other kite or the parents carrying food for a week or more, bringing it back and just circling with it. So it obviously, these, these group mobbing events, I have seen the, the group, first of all, um, drive the predator out of the neighborhood. Doesn't mean the predator didn't return later, but I have seen them move them away from the nest successfully by swooping and striking them as a group. Uh, but, um, what was I gonna say? Uh, but it, it obviously has a psychological effect on the kites and I'm gonna talk about that later. All right, so I mentioned that they bathe together too. Swallowtail kites are so aerial that I have actually never seen one on the ground. I've had people tell me occasionally that they've seen a kite on the ground and, you know, at least or went down to get a bug and then flew off, but that's not, not something they do normally because I've never seen it. Uh, and so here are two kites that kept, they kept taking turns, dipping one after the other, uh, bathing and drinking on the water here, and here's another one drinking on the water. Highly social highly aerial. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what most of my research has focused on. Uh, the demography of swallowtail kites. Uh, is the population increasing? Is it decreasing? I mean, people ask me that all the time, and I'm like, you know, that's a really hard question to answer definitively. All you can really do is model and provide some estimates and, and give people your best guess and justify it the best you can. Anyway, I think the swallowtail kites are not doing very well right around here, and I'll uh, talk about that more, but survival, 
uh, is one thing, annual productivity, like how many young each pair has produced is one thing that we've taken a long look at and then survival using radio telemetry, um, fledging to one year of age and then one year to two years of age and then adult survival. So let me talk a little bit about that. First of all, to find the nests uh, and, and monitor for productivity, uh, we would use the airplane and sighting reports. The airplane is a really good way to survey an area and not have a bias, because if you're just searching from a road or you're just searching from a trail, you're gonna miss a lot of kites and, and you know, you're only going where a road can take you. So uh, I've always used the airplane and uh, to, to locate neighborhoods. And then we would try to get in from the ground and find nests or sometimes just find the nest from the airplane too, but, or, or a boat. Um, and this is Wesley Smith, a longtime volunteer. Uh, Bonnie Schumacher was our pilot one year. And this is the uh, West Pearl River here. And you can see the Lock Canal back there. Okay, so annual productivity would be that we would monitor the nests weekly and try to determine how many young fledged from the nest. Swallowtail kites have from one to three young. Three is really rare. I've only seen it a handful of times. It's usually one to two. And uh, their annual productivity for our area is pretty high. It's, you know, one per, per, per pair. And that's a sample size of, you know, close to you know, 668 nests. So that's considered high for a bird of prey, but is it high enough if you're a long distance migrant and um, maybe adults aren't living long enough? Is part of the question. Oh yeah, this is from Tal Sheik, that little baby fledged, yay. Uh, so one of the things that we did to monitor survival out of the nest uh, is to climb trees. Swallowtail kites tend to nest higher up in the tree than any other bird of prey I've ever seen. Their nests are often as high as fish crow nests. And so they're in the upper 80% of the, I mean, 20% uh, of the canopy above the 80% line. So let's see, this is Kevin Iyer climbing a tree and then he would rappel down because we're trying not to harm the tree. This is Donald Ray lowering some babies down out of a nest right here. And uh, so this is Donata's hands and my hands, <laughs> radio tagging a baby. Uh, what we would need to do is get the birds right before fledging, not at the stage where they would jump because we don't want them to fledge prematurely. So it's pretty tricky aging them from the ground, but anyway, getting the age right. Uh, and then uh, this is the VHF radio transmitter with a two year battery life. So we could monitor the first two years of survival using these. And then, of course, that means that if it's a VHF radio, that somebody has to go around with a big antenna. So I had antennas coming off of the airplane, big Yagi antennas, uh, searching for them from the air, searching for them from a boat with a handheld antenna and driving around a lot too. So uh, with radio tracking, we were able to determine a survival rate from fledging to one year of um, 42%. And then of the ones that live to one year, 66% um, of those survived to two years. So made these long distance migrations. Now, because the radio transmitter battery died, we don't have an estimate for three years. So for some of my modeling, what I've used is Ken Meyer's adult survival rate of 0.78 or 78% uh, in doing some real basic population modeling. Okay, so another way that we have monitored survival and um, tried to get an estimate of like lifetime reproductive success or something that's equivalent to that is to put GPS satellite transmitters on birds. And these could theoretically last the life of the bird because it has two solar cells here powering the battery. Uh, this is right at the range of, they, they're just light enough that it's less than, um, 3% of the bird's weight, body weight, and uh, they can, the bird band and lab will allow them without making it experimental. The data is not real time. It uploads and you get it every th three days. So what that means is if the transmitter 
dies in, if the if the kite dies in between an upload and the bird is on its back, um, you I mean, or the the transmitter is not seeing the sun, then you you won't know exactly where it died. You'll just know where it last was. So uh, here is a unfortunate swallowtail kite who was um, who died in Texas. She was killed in the roost, and we actually tracked the because of the transmitter locations we were able to find the roost where she was killed and we found some feathers there and other parts and then we tracked her to the great horned owl's day roost and found the transmitter there with part of her wing and we also found the remains of a broadwing hawk there too so this great horned owl was snacking on birds of prey um, of the 11 adults that that orleans audubon has tagged um, they're, they're all dead now. We're going to be deploying some new transmitters next year. Um, three were killed by birds of prey on the breeding grounds. Another one, I thought, the, the one in the Pascagoula River Basin, I thought he was probably killed by an owl. He disappeared and we found, we checked his roost sites and what we found were um, a lot of birds, a lot of uh, herons and an ibis in that rookery, uh, the, the Boneyard Lake rookery were being killed by great horned owls. So, and we found the great horned owl, but we didn't find kite remains under them. We had one transmitter that failed. And then uh, on five that died on migration of unknown cause and one that died on the wintering grounds. And so from that, you could kind of come up with an average survival for those 11 birds um, of 2.56 years during the time that they're monitored. Now, for them to be tagged, they were probably already three years old because uh, they, they were in adult plumage and swallowtail kites, we know from the, the juveniles that we tracked that they don't breed at age one and they don't breed at age two. So we were trapping breeders, so they had to be a three years old or older at the time of tagging. Okay, so the, because it's a GPS satellite transmitter that will last the life of the bird, they all die in the end. It's called like known fate, you know, so, um, but it's really good demographic information. And uh, Lacombe is one of the, the Lacombe male is one of the birds that died on the northbound migration. And uh, he died in northeastern Costa Rica on the Nicaraguan border on their largest wildlife refuge for the country in the middle of nowhere, in a wet, wet area. Okay, so uh, moving on to predation, a lot of my study has focused on predation at nests. And I really wondered about this whole dynamic between great horned owls and swallowtail kites, because it is the raptor, great horned owls, red-tailed hawks, and bald eagles are the raptors that swallowtail kites mob most vigorously. And uh, the I was interested in the on, nest predation effects for when an adult is killed on a nest because demographically, I mean, you know, who wants to see baby kites killed? Not me, but demographically, and the loss of an adult has a lot more meaning because it took so long for that adult to get to that age, to, to reach breeding age, to um, gain experience, being able to raise young. Anyway, so we looked at predation rates whether one sex was more likely to be killed on the nest, what were the predators involved, and could there be any carryover effects? Carryover effects meaning like affecting what kites do the next year or following years. So this study uh, is in collaboration with the Avian Research and Conservation Institute, and they were working in Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. And so we pooled our data and we have data on 48 adults that were killed on the nest. All of them were killed by large raptors. I mean, some other likely predators could be a raccoon. A raccoon can tear apart a bird, especially if it got it at night. You know, it could kill an adult. We just haven't documented it. Uh, and so we looked at, for the 48 adults, we collected remains from 47 of them. And of those 47, we were able to get intact DNA from 60%. You know, it's funny, it's pretty frustrating, right? Because 
you hear about all these things like, oh man, they got DNA out of a fossil? Like, how did that happen? You know, so you think, well, surely if a bird died within that month or within that week, surely you're going to get DNA out of it. But as it turns out, if you're floating in the swamp or something gets rained on and soaked, a lot of that really degrades DNA and, and may or may not get enough intact DNA. Okay, so these are, these are this is a PCR that shows uh, sample sexing results from live kites here. So these are blood. And so these are females, the ones that show three bands and the males show one band. And then if you look down here, this, these are from a dead kite. This is uh, a bird that was killed in Slidell and by a great horned owl. And so these are two samples and you can see this, this particular sample of tissue yielded a lot more DNA than this one did. But anyway, um, showing that it was indeed a female that was killed on the nest. So from our results, we had one male that was killed on the nest and uh, 27 females. So obviously it's much more likely that it's gonna be a female that's killed on the nest. Now that's of interest because in birds, females tend to be the limiting sex. So is it possible that this could make females uh, limiting in this population or contribute to the problem? Uh, then you could argue though, well, maybe males are just being killed on the roost. And I don't have enough data yet to really say whether that could be the case, that there's equal predation rates on males. It doesn't seem to be the case, um, but uh, it's certainly possible. Okay, so to uh, identify predators, our main methods were to monitor things frequently. If you check often, there's likely to still be remains left, or maybe you might find the birds mobbing the predator right next to the nest, or eating the young on the nest, whatever it might be. Uh, also using telemetry. So telemetry would allow tracking the remains, you know, because a lot of times the predators carry part of the kite and sit on it and eat, eat the remains later. Get away from where the kites are hitting it in the head. Uh, and uh, that also might allow us to discover the predator or find its pellet. So a few times we found kite remains in the pellets. This is an owl pellet because you can see that it's got a lot of bones still left in it. Um, we weren't able to get DNA out of the slime on the outside of the pellet though, unfortunately, because we tried to determine the, the which species of owl it was. But judging by the size and the habitat, I think it was a great horned owl. So confirmed nest predators are these. Uh, Mississippi kite, you might be surprised to see that. There was a nest in, in uh, Texas where the swallowtail kites and the Mississippi kites were just having an aerial battle. Normally they nest close by, they feed together. But they were having a, a knockout drag out fight and the fight ended up on the nest and then the nest was abandoned the next day. It was a, it was a group of Mississippi kites that were thugs, <laughs> a gang. <laughs> uh, and I've seen some interesting things, like I've seen red-shouldered hawks, these are suspected nest predators. I've seen red-shouldered hawks fly up to an incubating swallowtail kite and hit it in the chest, trying to get it off of the nest, you know, or just a little, a little punch. Or um, blue jays moving all around the nest in a group and really worrying the adult that gets up and does like that to try to make the blue jays leave and then sits back down on the eggs real tight. But uh, we've definitely had crows going, fish crows robbing the nest, the nest of eggs and young. Uh, so predators of adults, what we've been able to document and this N equals 24, this is the Louisiana Mississippi study where we were going to a, a sample of nests more often, really frequent, and had a lot of birds tagged. Uh, so probably it's possible that all the predation was due to great horned owl, um, because I don't, I don't think that a barred owl can really tear apart a swallowtail kite the way, you know, the, the remains that we were seeing and carry it off, because it only weighs a little bit more than a swallowtail kite, whereas a great horned owl is substantially bigger. So I really think that this was all, it could have, some of this could have been eagle or um, possibly red-tailed hawk, but I don't think any of it was barred owl. Barred owls do prey on the young though. Oh yeah, and where we knew the timing at 11 nests. Um, oh, wait. 
I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, yeah, 11 nests were depredated at night, we were sure. One of them was really early in the morning um, that we knew was great horned owl. Uh, but there was definitely some nocturnal predation for sure, which would indicate great horned owl. So uh, this is just an examination of what's the, what's the time span over which an adult is at risk of being depredated on the nest. And so we looked at how long this, it turns out swallowtail kites brood their babies for quite a long time. If it's an egg, they're gonna be there every night. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna spend the night on the nest. And then uh, once they have young, they're brooding them up until 31 days old, which is a pretty big baby, it, it, but it varies. Uh, anyway, so I, I have another slide about that, but so 54% of kites were killed during incubation and 46% were killed while they were brooding young. So it's, it's a pretty substantial, it's 61 days during their nesting time. And then the babies are fledging at about day 70. That's eggs and counting the incubation and, and the development. Uh, and then we looked at which sex spent the night on the nest. You know, like Christy gave us a talk about the Anis and um, their nocturnal care. Uh, some of the cuckoos, uh, it's the males that are spending the night on the nest. Well, in the swallowtail kites, it's usually the female that spends the night on the nest. With our GP, this was all like spot checks at the nest at night where we knew the sex of one of the birds. So they was all females every, every night that we checked. But and this is the moon coming through the Swallowtail Kites nest tree. The nest is right there. Uh, but um, some of the, a couple of the GPS satellite tag, tag birds, we did have them spend the night on the nest, males. And it was because the female had abandoned the nest, either abandoned it or died because she wasn't tagged, so we don't know. But the night that she abandoned the nest, the male said, well, I guess I better stay here because she's not coming back. So the male does sometimes, it's not exclusively female, and I guess that's how that one male probably got nailed on the nest, unless it was killed during the day. Anyway, uh, so as I said, they spend an average of 61 nights on the nest, and that represents uh, about 17% of the yearly cycle. And if we look at uh, the effects of how, how many nests are depredated, this is uh, nest fates for those nests that we were doing the productivity analysis. Um, other failure is usually weather, with mostly wind, wind blowing the babies out of the nest or peeling the top of the nest off or the tree falling into the creek because of weather. Um, anyway, about half the nests are successful, which is pretty high. And uh, predation accounts for about 24% of nest failure. So I wondered if, what I noticed was that if there had been predation in an area, uh, sometimes that area was not used again. Kites have pretty strong fight, site fidelity, but if there was a lot of death, and especially if an adult was killed, that it was way less likely for kites to return to that area again. And so I did a, an analysis that um, showed that indeed uh, nest sites were vacated uh, the following year, that sometimes entire neighborhoods were abandoned, especially if a couple of adults were killed uh, at, at different nests. And uh, again, I do wonder if it could cause female limitation, but I have not found a statistical Result showing that, uh, the sex ratio, in other words. So uh, moving on to migration ecology, which is really a fun thing to study. Uh, this is the bird that we caught in Texas, and that's the GPS satellite transmitter. So the, the results that I'm going to discuss now are, again, um, in collaboration with Ken Meyer and Gina Kant of the Avian Research and Conservation Institute in Gainesville, Florida. And so this is Orleans Audubon's kites and Arcs kites all shown on this map here. Well, it's not all of them. 
but it's it's a lot of them. So they're the global journey of the swallowtail kite. You know, they do this 10,000 mile round trip migration. They are spending the winter down mostly in southern Brazil. We did have some that went to Atlantic coastal Brazil when we were doing VHF tracking too, um, but that we haven't seen any birds going there recently. And look at, look at the Gulf of Mexico, what a mess that is. I'm gonna talk about that now, or in, a, in just a minute. So if you look at what's 10,000 miles, okay, like that would be to the, a journey to the center of the earth and back again, you know? Um, any, any kite that's uh, uh, done a, a, a couple of, li lived, sorry, any kite that's lived long enough to breed has, has navigated the, the earth, <laughs> has gone that far. Uh, if we look at what kites do on their trip, they actually, on their way to Brazil, they cross the Andes at its highest point in Colombia, where the peaks are between um, 3,000 to 3,500 meters high. I mean, you know, flying high is nothing to them. They love it. <laughs> uh, and half of their time, about half of their annual budget is spent, or I'm sorry, not half, about a third of their annual budget is spent getting there. Get going down to Brazil, coming back to the breeding grounds. So when they're doing their spring and fall migration, a lot of times they're kind of like, oh, let me hang out here for a while. Let me, there are a lot of important stopover points that we know of where kites gather in big groups in Central and South America. Uh, Gina Kent had documented some of these. And uh, so they're a globe trotter. Okay, let's talk about the Gulf of Mexico. In the spring, there's generally a race to leave the Yucatan and get cross, straight across the Gulf, if you're, in, if you're a Louisiana kite, uh, to return to here and get to your breeding grounds ASAP. Uh, and this is about a 550 mile trip if it's, if it's a direct flight and uh, no layovers, you know. And um, with favorable winds, a kite might cross that, meaning the tailwind might cross that Cross that in 13 to 15 hours, something like that. Uh, but that's not always how it happens. And so we've looked at how these kites navigate the Gulf. Like this was the strong river kite that we caught in central Mississippi. And uh, this is in the fall from July 20th to August 17th. He started off up here and he did the Western Circum Gulf route. He stayed over land. Well, I mean, that's fall migration. So you could say, well, there's really no rush to get down to the, breed to the wintering grounds. And indeed that may be true. And then we can look at what Lacombe did, let's say in 2015 in the fall migration, he took an Eastern route. He spent a lot of time here and then in the, in the Pearl River Basin. And then he went through Florida following mostly an overland route. And then here, this is a kind of, this is a dangerous water crossing here too over, over Cuba and the Straits of Florida and reaching the Yucatan here. So this is what a lot of the East Coast kites take this route, the Eastern route. But here was a bird for the Lacombe bird doing that. And now we can take a look at Pancha Tlawa's uh, Gulf of Mexico crossing. So the blue ones are the fall ones, the green ones are the spring ones. So it's showing him doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And that seems to be what our kites do. Some of it is of course weather dependent, but notice that in the spring, here he hit a, a, a cold front that, you know, made him veer off. But he was, it looks like he was trying to go straight across and then got sidetracked a little bit, but you know, he made it without too much trouble. So uh, this was a spring return that didn't, didn't go, well, it was a harrowing spring return. We, it was a nail biter for us because he, this, the past Google Mail spent four nights over water and he almost made landfall a couple of times like here and here. And then when he finally made landfall, he actually flew for a little while before he went to roost. So he clearly wasn't about to die from this, uh, the, day, the days and nights over water crossing the Gulf. He was one of the lucky ones and he did breed that year. So here are just a few 
stats on based on the GPS satellite birds. This is like their estimated time over water. Um, and then when they were crossing the Gulf. And then uh, these, this is the mean altitude in meters and the range. Look at this. This is that same past Google mail, that same trip. Look at this. I mean, now this could be a faulty report, but it's also entirely possible that he was swept up in some bad weather and got up really high at one point. <laughs> but uh, anyway, pretty crazy. And this is their speed in knots, their mean speed. Kind of fun, fun factoids. Uh, and then this is uh, Pearl, Mississippi was a, a bird that we tagged in the Pearl. And here was another time when he almost made it to land. And then, I mean, he was so close. And then uh, hit a, a strong spring cold front and had to turn back. And he flew, he had to go sideways across the Gulf and then came across around here to make it back to, to the breeding grounds. He did nest in, in uh, 2013. That was the year that he was hit that cold front. This is the track for Slidell, who was a female kite. She was a proven breeder, um, had produced two young every year. Uh, we had, she was always arriving early to the breeding grounds and, and we would see her like clockwork but she arrived really late in 2013. And this is what happened to her. So here she is coming off of the Yucatan Peninsula and she gets a little more than halfway across the Gulf when look what she does, she turns around. She just kept trying to go forward, trying to go forward, couldn't make any headway into that really strong spring cold front and finally turned around, went, made landfall in Mexico, went down to Oaxaca, where she might be like the only swallow to kite record for Oaxaca, then came back and spent a lot of time going up and down here in Veracruz and, you know, just really clearly had some life-changing experience, right? Goes overland, not her typical MO. We uh, met her on the breeding grounds here, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. She didn't breed this year. She, she wandered everywhere. We knew that there were three nests there and this was her nest from the previous year. And there was already a pair, there, there was a female on there incubating eggs. And when we saw when she was gonna arrive and we, we went out there and waited and we actually saw six kites and they were displaying over these nests that were already established that had incubating kites on them on April 11th. And she was the only one alarm calling. She was over that nest going, key, 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 which is, I mean, you know, I can't even tell you what that, it's really foul what it means in kite language. <laughs> she was very upset. So again, that just shows what a devastating spring 2013 was. Um, I won't show this slide for too long. Thanks, Paul Conover, for it. But um, he found a kite that was washed up. On, this was a, a March. 23rd cold front. So this was a different one on Holly Beach. And then um, one of the ARC kites uh, that our colleagues in Gainesville had tagged died three days later. Uh, it was floating around about 50 kilometers from Holly Beach in the water. And this is Withla, another one that in April 7th that was um, floating. She, Gina had marked rigs because she hoped that it was possibly floating on a rig, but um, I mean, perched on a rig, but unfortunately, no. And you can see that's the bird foot delta of Louisiana. So 2013 was a bad spring for kites. Um, and so for our cohort, uh, three of the 13, when I say our, including Avian Research and Conservation Institute, uh, three of the 13 tagged adults died attempting to cross the Gulf. Um, and uh, three of the 10 adults that made it back did not breed that year. So that tells us a lot about their demography that, you know, if there are years that they don't breed because they've, you know, for example, faced really harrowing water crossings. So that was 46%, almost half of the cohort that was negatively affected that year. Okay, well, let's talk about some other things then. <laughs> All right, I wanted to uh, certainly mention the master's thesis that my friend Audrey Washburn did. 
Uh, she, her, the, the, the title of it is Phylogeography of the Swallowtail Kite. And this was in 2007, uh, published at the University of Florida. If we look at the range of the swallowtail kite, the breeding range, courtesy of Cornell, uh, you can see that there's a big area where kites don't breed, most of Mexico, right? And so these are pretty disjunct, pop separated populations, right? And so she was looking at, she was taking um, tissue samples from museum specimens mostly and looking at the relationships and what she found was the northern population is very distantly, is, is quite separated from the southern population. So this is the northern subspecies, this is the southern subspecies. And I mean, her results were distant enough to show them as separate species. And the importance of that is, you know, people always say, well, the swallowtail kite, you know, it's doing really well in Florida. Um, it's, it's got a great global pop population. But if this northern subspecies is indeed a cryptic species, I don't think the swallowtail kite is doing so well, especially in my neck of the woods. All right, so uh, I wanted to mention a resource. Uh, if you go to the Orleans Audubon Society's website under um, Raptor Projects or something, and the menu bar, uh, there's the swallowtail kite section and you can download the swallowtail kite conservation brochure. We also have a printed version that I would be happy to mail to groups. You can just get in touch with me about that. And it has uh, not only conservation recommendations, but it also has a lot of just general information about swallowtail kites, including this figure, which I thought birders would be interested in. Um, just a little quick thing about identifying plumages so when we capture an adult swallowtail kite, we can tell that it's an adult because it has a longer, a wider wingspan and a longer tail than a bird that's a one-year-old. So this is a baby that's a fledgling where its tail feathers have not grown out completely yet. And uh, I guess they're hard penned at about nine to 10 weeks old. And then this is a kite that is a one-year-old, so it's lost. What happens with the buffiness, and some of them have black streaks on the feathers too, that tends to fade pretty quickly. It's, it gets bleached, it's um, porphyrins in the feathers. And then uh, there's also some white scalloping on the dorsal surface of some of the feathers that isn't shown on this illustration. But anyway, you know, we call these the short-tailed hawks. So we know from telemetry, that they don't breed at, at this age and, and or, or at two years of age either. Okay, so this is just a, a this was um, the first birds that I tagged at a nest in uh, Magnolia Forest subdivision in 1993 with Rufus Harris's help. And he took this picture and um, I learned pretty quickly to wear better field clothes. See, yeah, better clothing choices. <laughs> and this is a uh, this is when one of the first. It's not the first adult that we caught, but we were setting up a net for uh, one of the adults that we caught in 1997. The early days there. Just wanted to thank my buddy Rufus Harris. Uh, uh, major sources of funding for the project are the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science and Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Koipu Foundation, the U.S. Geological Survey, Biological Resources Division, Orleans Audubon Society, LO, Louisiana Ornithological Society. A couple of projects that are coming up. This will be in 2013. Uh, we're going to be working with the American Bird Conservancy. Uh, they have a a partnership with International Paper and the Avian Research Conservation Institute. Orleans Audubon is joining on board with that. Uh, this is Gina Kent and E.J. Williams is with uh, American Bird Conservancy. They're tagging a kite here. We are going to be looking for swallowtail kites on working forests, providing uh, international paper experts with the nest locations, and uh, they're going to work with landowners that they're buying paper from to try to conserve nest sites. And we're also gonna tag some birds, put some GPS satellite, or actually GSM, G GPS GSM transmitters on some birds there. 
And we're also going to be partnering with the uh, with BITNEP, the Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program. Uh, Natalie Waters is one of our main collaborators there. And the Avian Research Conservation Institute will be helping us with this project too. We are going to survey the Barataria Terrebonne Basin to try to find nests uh, because we don't know very much about the nest locations there. Monitor nests and uh, put GPS satellite transmitters on, on a couple of birds there so we can look at their use in the basin and see their survivorship and see where they migrate to. So let's see. So I would like to give a great big thank you to um, the volunteers for this project. It's really impossible to thank everyone who's helped with the Swallowtail Kite project over the years because it's been literally hundreds and hundreds. But there are certain individuals I'd like to thank who really helped with project design and with monitoring nests and tracking radio tag birds photography, helped secure funding, helped decide survey routes, helped solicit sighting reports, compile data, uh, collaborators, people taking us out in boats, etc., cetera, uh, landowners. Anyway, uh, thank you everyone who submitted eBird reports, emailed me and called me with sighting reports. It's all been a huge help. And now I'd like to entertain any questions you might have.